going to go over uh, a way of proving things in mathematics called induction, a proof by induction. And thus is very well suited for proving things having to do with a pattern. Let's say you've got some pattern that you notice. It's based upon the natural numbers, the counting numbers. One, two, three, four. Those are natural numbers. Notice that if you take a look at one, it equals one squared. And one is an odd number. Well, not in the sense that it's unusual, but in the sense that it's not even. Two doesn't divide it. So if you add another n odd number, something odd happens. One plus three, that adds up to four. Notice if I add two odd numbers, it's two squared. Hmm, wonder if this continues. What if I put the third odd number in there? Okay, we had four from before. Add five more, that's nine. Hey, if I add up three odd numbers, it's three squared. See the pattern? Nine. Okay. Add one more odd number. Right? You get 16, which is four squared. It seems to be working, <clears throat> but this is not in itself a proof that will always work. Maybe it only works for the first few hundred thousand billion and then stops. So the question is, if you want to say that this pattern continues forever, you need to do a proof that won't take forever to do. So I'm going to describe this pattern of adding odd numbers. And notice that if I have a pattern of adding the next odd number, so if I wanted to say, OK, I want the 10th odd uh, number, I can get the 10th odd number by saying 2 times n minus 1, right? 2 times 10 is 20. 20 take away 1 is 19. 19 is the 10th odd number. So this over here is a formula to give me the next term. And notice how it works from the very beginning. The first one, 2 times 1 minus 1 is 1. How about 3? That's the second one. So 2 times 2 is for the second odd number. That's 4 minus 1 gives me my second odd number. So this formula has to do with just generating the next one in the series. <clears throat> and then obviously how do you describe this pattern is you got two numbers, you square two. You got five numbers, you square five. So that's just the number of numbers, n, squared. and once I have an abstract way of saying the pattern, I can use mathematics to try to prove it. But you may not have seen this proof before. This is called a proof by induction. A proof by induction is a three-step process. You have to establish that it's true somewhere. Usually you have to establish that it's true in the first case of the pattern. And then independent of the first case, you just say, well, if it were true for n of them, would, it, would you actually get the exact same pattern for one more? So the way we say that in math is if it's true for n, will it still be true for n plus 1? Finally, you put these two together. These are like three legs of a tripod. It only works for a proof if all of them are true, all of them working together. All by itself, either, any one of them is not enough to prove it for all of them. So what do we do in step three? Well, we, put, we link them together. If it's true for the first case, I then put the conclusion from this step into the conclusion of the next step to prove, OK, it is true for n is 1. And if it's first, that must mean it's true for the second, because that's 1 plus 1. Then I can use step 3 again. It's true for the second now. It must be true for the third. It's true for the fourth, so it must be true for the fifth. And because of that, the step three, there's no much work to do, but you have to explain your proof. A proof, after all, is an argument or a, or a discussion or a story about why you think something is true. Um, the conclusion being, there's no end to this process. Therefore, it must be true for all of those natural numbers. Let's see one. It's best to understood to see it in, in, in let's start with our first one there, the, the sum of those odd numbers. If you've got n not odd numbers, and remember, this is just the formula for the odd number, you actually will have a total of n squared if you were to add them all up with addition. OK, now let's see if this is true for the first case. Well, that means I'm going to only add one odd number. 
Well, that's pretty easy. It's just 1. And then the formula on the right-hand side, I just use LHS for left-hand side, because that's this stuff. And right-hand side, that's that stuff. I put 1 in for the formula, and sure enough, they match. So it works for the formula of n squared works when n is 1, for the adding up the just one odd number. All right. <clears throat> now let's just say it's true for n of them. Must it then be true for the next one? or n plus 1. This looks more complicated than it is. All right, now I got a sum of odd numbers. This is the nth odd number. Remember our formula? What's the one after this? Well, all I have to do is put n plus 1 in place of n. Can you see I just put it? And that gives me the n plus 1, or the next odd number. Great. So here is the sum of not n, but here's the sum of n plus 1. Let's see if we get this pattern. Well, what would the pattern look like? Well, it would look like n plus 1 squared rather than n squared. Let's see if I can do that. Well, I'm presuming that on the second step that when it's true for n of them, here's the n of them. I just put a little box around. And here's the, the next one. Well, if it's true for n, I can replace these this long list of n odd numbers with that formula n squared, because I know the sum of n of them are going to equal n squared if it were true for n. And then I just tack on the next one. Now I could distribute out this 2, and then I could probably combine some like terms, and then I could probably factor that. Oh my goodness, there it is. It's n plus 1 squared. So adding up all the odd numbers up to n of them and then doing the next one, n plus 1 of them, combines to be n plus 1 squared. But that's only true if it was true for n of them. You can notice how I substituted that formula. Ah, so all by itself, step 2, important as it is, does not prove it all by itself because I didn't establish it was true for n. I just said if it were true for n, it does work out. Well, that's what step three is about. <clears throat> Put it together. It's true for one. Step two would then imply it would be true for two. Now that I know it's true for two, it's true for three, four, five, all of them. So these are just like legs of a chair or legs of a, of a little tripod. You need all three, linking them all together, interdependent. If each one of them is true its own, then together it proves it's true for all natural numbers n. Pretty neat. Okay, let's see if we can generalize this principle. Let's do a different pattern. Okay, we have a pattern here. Uh, if you just count up the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to n, turns out there's a quick way of adding them up by just multiplying something. For instance, if you want to add up the first 10 numbers, you just do 1 half of 10 times 11. So half of 10 is 5 times 11, 55. 55 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to 10. Did you know that? Maybe you did. If you were a 10-year-old Carl Friedrich Gauss from the last century ago, actually before then, now we're a couple centuries away. It's in the mid-1800s. He was 10, and the story goes that he figured that out. Anyway, let's see if it's true anywhere. If I add the first number, does it equal this formula when I put 1 for n? Well, does 1 equal this? 1 half of 1 times 1 plus 1, that's half of 2. Oh, yeah, it works for the 1. It's important. It seems trivial, and yet if it's going to be a rigorous proof, it has to be true somewhere in order for it to be true anywhere. You have to establish that for at least one particular case. So we've done that. That plants us in the ground. Alone doesn't do much, but together, very important. Now, the next bit, the one that gets all the, all the attention usually, if it's true in the case of n, must it also be true for the next case if you add 1 to n? All right, so let's add up not n integers, but n plus 1 integers, so one after n. Notice the formula is pretty easy, uh, much easier than the last one. Maybe I should have used this as the first example. Oh, you've already seen the first example, so it's 
points mute. All right. Focus in on this part. Notice that because I get to presume it's true for n, I can replace these n consecutive integers with my formula. See my formula there? And then just add the next term. Just add n plus 1 to that. Now, look what happens if I were to combine them by distributing out the n and then making a common, I like to put them all in one batch, so I'm going to take one half of this if I were to double. So I'm just putting this over a fraction, kind of like adding a whole number to a fraction. So if I double the innards and take half on the outside, what this lets me do is write the one half once on the outside so I can mix and match these guys. And then I can factor it. And when I do, guess what I get? I get the right-hand side, if you were to replace n plus 1 in place of n. Now, see that formula? It looks more complicated. That's only because wherever you see an n, we have an n plus 1. See? So it's true. Now, icing on the cake. We all like icing on cakes. Step 1 together with step 2 means that it's true for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, in fact, for all n. So by themselves, they don't establish much. This is only true if it's true for n. We don't know if it's true for n. Well, there is one particular n that it works, 1, which means step 2 says it must be true for 2. Now that we have 2, must be true for 3, must be true for 4, must be true for 5. So you'll see that all by themselves, it's not much of an argument. Put them together, like with step 3, ah, it works together to get all the counting numbers. All right, one more. I wanted to show you how you can how flexible this can be. This one isn't. Um, this is actually just a statement that if you have two to the n, it's bigger than n. Um, that works to the natural numbers bigger than one. Uh, and uh, I just want to let you see how you can use induction in a more flexible way. It doesn't have to be about adding up a sequence like we've been doing in the last two examples. So in this case, we're not going to start at one. We're going to start at some other place. And the logic still works as long as it starts at somewhere. Could start at n is equal to zero. n equals negative three. It doesn't really matter where. The logic step here requires you to say that it's true for some n. Once we do that, we can link it to the next. All right, so does it work for two? Notice two. I can't put one because one's not greater than one. So I have to start with two. So I put in two. So does 2 to the 2 greater than 2? Yeah, sure is. 4 is greater than 2, right? All right, that's true for at least the first case. Now, must it always be true? And again, I just want to show you how flexible this logic is. We're going to use uh, this general case. So we need to look at not 2 to the n so much. We have to see if 2 to the n plus 1 is larger than n plus 1. Let's see what we get. Well, that means um, we could t break apart exponents. Can you see how this is n plus 1? You're adding exponents whenever you multiply something with the same base. See how if you have base 2 raised to the first power, base 2 raised to the n power, when I multiply this together, I can just add exponents. So that means I can factor it out. So I can factor out by multiplying 2 times 2 to the n, and it gives me 2 to the n plus 1. Why did I do that? Because I get to presume that it's true for the case of n, and I have this nice little 2 to the n. And isn't this the case where we already know that 2 to the n is larger than n? Where We don't have to prove the hypothesis. We just have to say that when this is true, the next one will also be true. So this is the case where it is true. Since I know 2 to the n is larger than n, I know certainly 2 to the 2 to the n. If I just substitute n in this place, I know from before that it must be larger. 2 to the 2 to the n must be larger than 2 to the n by 
my hypothesis. This is considering the case where that happens to be true. But now I need to look at, okay, what does that mean for n plus 1? Well, you know, numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is uh, going to give you more results? Doubling the number or adding 1 to the number? I suppose technically we should prove this with induction, but for now I'm proving something else, so I'm just going to appeal to your better sense. Uh, would you rather have me double your money in your wallet, or would you rather me add one dollar to it in your wallet? Which is better? Obviously, multiplying by two is going to give you more results than to adding one if the number you're talking about is a positive integer, right? Non-zero. So, because of that, I can certainly say 2 times a number is greater than adding 1 to a number, at least for these numbers, greater than 1. And now we've linked the chain. Notice how 2 to the 2 to the n must be bigger than this. Ah, in other words, 2 to the n plus 1 is bigger than n plus 1. Ah, so... I just completed the second step, which means it's true for all of them. If I link them together with the third step, 1 and 2 together, must imply that it's true for all of them. Oops, notice how I have a little error here. <laughs> this particular case starts at 1, not 2, so I should probably change that. <laughs> okay, good luck with that. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it's important at this point that you see the logic um, it's good practice for your uh, problem-seeking cells, but uh, it takes a little bit of practice. So hopefully these examples set you on your way.